The forecasts we used to get, the growth we have been used to of revenue from Palo Alto Networks is what, 20%, 30% year-on-year growth. We're now having to get more used to potentially an 11% growth perspective. Is this buyer fatigue for cyber? Not really. Uh, first of all, Caroline, thank you for having me here. Remember, uh, we are planning to deliver close to $2 billion of revenue in Q4. That makes us close to an $8 billion company for the year. And our growth rates are forecast between 10 and 15%. So there is no buyer fatigue in cybersecurity. We are the first company to break the barrier and get to that scale in cybersecurity, making us north of $100 billion of market cap. So no, I think cybersecurity is a very robust market from a demand perspective, and our teams are executing amazingly around the world. Let's talk about where, therefore, the robust demand comes from and what for. You've talked a lot about ultimately sort of being an everything offering. A platformization is what is necessary. That's part of the st strategy, if I'm correct. The idea that, yes. yes, you want to be able to ensure that all parts are sophisticatedly protected, but how does that win out versus what people have called sort of a best-in-breed offering, where you're focusing on one particular element of cyber? I think the important way to think about it, Caroline, is if you think back 15, 20 years ago, we used to have a multitude of applications across our enterprise which did customer management things. Today, you don't think about having 15 different applications to manage your customers. You either use Salesforce or Oracle or Microsoft Dynamics. You don't use 14 best of breed applications to solve your customer problems. Take the problem in HR. You use you know, people systems, whether it's Workday or others. So you are getting to a place where these these concepts require integration across these best of breed capabilities. Otherwise, the onus of integration goes on the customer, which means every customer has to be able to take these best of breed, stitch them together, and create amazing security outcomes. On the other side, you got bad actors who've changed their tactics. They can get in and out of your business in under an hour and exfiltrate large amounts of data. So I think it's a, it's a problem that's stacked up against companies if they plan to stitch this stuff together for years to come. That's why we need to move towards a more integrated, things that work together and a more real-time outcome of security strategy as opposed to the best of breed strategy, which has worked historically. But with your shares under pressure, is the market understanding that? Is the market saying, okay, yeah, I buy the platformization? Well, our shares have done very well over the last one year. I think these short-term bumps are part of the absorption by the market of where the market needs to go. We've done really well in the last five years. We've already done really well in the last one year. I think the important part is to understand it's a very strong demand market we're executing amazingly. We are the largest player in the market. And the number of conversations, the number of platform deals we did this quarter far exceeded any that we've done in history, which sets us at the right, in the right direction to try and achieve a $15 billion ARR number, which we've targeted in the next few years. So we think things are on track and we're executing. You're liking the ARR number. There is a number in your metrics that you don't like people really focusing on, and that's the billing <laughs> forecast. You say, look, it's volatile, and ultimately it's, it's, it's sort of an artificial metric. But can you talk us through that a little bit? Because why is it artificial? You say it's due to payment terms changing, but everyone's a bit worried about this billing forecast being the slowest since your IPO. Well, I think what happened is when we lived in a zero interest rate environment, uh, people were willing to pay you up front for years of upcoming service. Today, CFOs get involved, they're saying, listen, I'll pay you when you deliver the service. You look at the companies you name, the companies that are in the ARR business, which are on an annualized payment plan, there they give you ARR and you know, annual values, and that seems to work. For us, people look at, are you collecting all the money up front? So that's what billings is. Uh, in, our, in our view, the right number is RPO, or remaining performance obligations. Our RPO grew at 23%. We have $11.5 billion worth of services we intend to deliver to our customer over the next three years. So, that's an important metric. The growth is important because that tells you how big your book of business is that is committed by your customers. That gives you your true understanding of the strength of the business. I think billings can be managed depending on when customers choose to pay you. So I think that becomes a less reliable metric, particularly in a higher interest rate environment where customers are cautious about when they want to pay you. Is there likely to be pressure on contract length going forward, though? And what, what does that say about enterprises' desire to commit to cybersecurity protection? Actually, things are in the opposite direction, Caroline, because uh, if you take a longer contract, you get price protection, and in a higher interest rate mm -hmm. environment, you have the risk of higher prices in the future. So actually, you're seeing customers saying, guarantee me the price for longer, because I don't want to deal with inflationary impacts of price increases. I have to say, when you look at, ultimately, what all the analysts are saying versus your 
particular earnings. They really are saying that this is a knee-jerk reaction. You've got Vital Knowledge really saying the core fundamentals remain very healthy. A lot of the analysts out there saying they believe in the leadership right now, Nikesh. Talk to us, therefore, about what you believe and how artificial intelligence is changing your role as a leader and changing the way in which we protect against cybersecurity. We all talk about how much harder it's made life, but has it really in terms of attacks? Well, Caroline, let me break that question in two parts. First, in the last five years, our company has uh, gone up five times in value. So I think we've done really well to our sh for our shareholders. We've really done really well from an execution perspective. We're, you know, we're one of the largest companies now. We have an evergreen portfolio, like you mentioned, and we brought the notion that large cybersecurity companies can continue to innovate so our customers don't have to. In that context, if you look at AI, most recently we announced a series of AI security products because the enthusiasm for AI, both on unfortunately the bad actor side and the company side is high. People want to trial AI. You had a segment earlier where you know, we're seeing co-pilots being introduced. So everybody wants an AI buddy, an AI assistant to make their lives more productive. In that environment, every company is raring to go out and deploy that technology. Now you gotta be careful when you deploy it, it has to be secured by design. You have to make sure these LLMs don't hallucinate. You have to make sure nobody get inside, gets inside your LLM, poisons it with lots of data. And we're gonna see a lot of those attempts because bad actors have also learned the technology. So it's very important to deliver AI in such a way that it is secure for our customers and their end customers. And we've already pioneered uh, at RSA most recently a comprehensive suite of products which we intend to make available to all of our customers in the next four weeks, which allows them to go down this journey uh, and be secured from the get-go.